Hello everybody, I love a good automotive guilty pleasure. What's yours? Do you go delirious every time somebody mentions the Deulanos? Perhaps you're fizzy for the Fiat Multipla. Me, I've got quite a few of them, but in recent years I have developed a real soft spot for the Jeep Wrangler. And I know, I know, I shouldn't, but I do. Now, this I think is largely due to the fact that whenever I've driven one, it has been on holiday in the United States, where of course it works, and everything you drive on holiday automatically gets a few brownie points. But not that long ago, I got the chance to sample a US specification two-door Wrangler here in Britain and it wasn't the disaster that I thought it was going to be. So following on from that, I emailed Jeep and said, do you maybe have a UK spec Wrangler that I can live with for a week? And to my surprise, not only did they, but they said, yeah, sure, we'll send it to you. And it hasn't at all been the experience that I expected. My American audience, I'm sure, will already be very familiar with the Wrangler, but what about those at home? This isn't a particularly common sight here, so what exactly is it? Well, the Wrangler nameplate was introduced in 1986, and it is currently in its fourth generation, with this, the JL, that was introduced in 2017. And so the Wrangler is the modern-day evolution of the Jeep, aka the Willys Jeep, which dates back to the Second World War. And the ethos of the Wrangler has always been a fairly simple one. As the modern day incarnation of the original legend that is the Jeep, it has to be capable of going anywhere, doing anything, it has to be versatile. However, as a modern passenger vehicle, the Wrangler also has a number of concessions to daily use, so it's become a little nicer inside, it's become a little easier to live with year round, and of course, over years, it has also acquired a number of different pieces of technology. But at its core, this is still a proper old school off-roader, meaning body on frame construction and solid axles. Things that do somewhat hamper its on-road performance, but I am told by all that know them are reasons the Jeep Wrangler is much loved because where other cars have gone on to use unibody construction and more modern techniques and therefore are better on road, if you are serious about going off the black stuff, these things are still very, very much desirable. Over in the USA, these cars also come with a selection of different engines. You can have a 3.6-litre naturally aspirated V6, which is the base model, a four-cylinder 2-litre turbo, which is what we've got here, and sadly the one and only option in Britain. There is also this engine, but as a hybrid, there's then the Rubicon 392, which is a 392 cubic inch Hemi at 6.4 litres. Lovely, big, meaty V8. And I'd love to have one of those here, but uh, it's just not gonna happen, is it? There are, or were also, a, a couple of diesel options, I think, too, but um, petrol, really, I think, is the order of the day for most people in the States. And uh, you know what? This two-litre, it does okay. The car weighs two tonnes, but the engine has 272 horsepower and 295 pounds-feet of torque. That's 400 newton meters. Paired with an eight-speed automatic gearbox, I believe GM's own Torque Flight, it does an all right job. In fact, I even give the car brownie points because down here, if you do want to use manual mode, which you don't, the lever even goes the correct way, pull towards you for up. If Jeep can do it, anybody can do it. And it doesn't take long before you can see the proof that this is still a car very much designed for the off-roading crowd, because down here we have controls for not only the front and rear differentials, but even a disconnectable sway bar, that's an anti-roll bar for us Europeans. You of course also have the proper four-wheel drive lever over here with two high, four high, and then of course four low as well. 
if you open the rear tailgate, you'll even find printed all of the specifications, the dimensions of the car, the wading depths, and the approach angles it is capable of. This is a car designed for those that really do want to use them. But much like the Land Rover Defender, which I think really is our closest equivalent, Jeep found they had a lot of customers who were purchasing this not for its rugged off-road ability, but instead as a lifestyle statement. The Jeep Wrangler has become a modern day style icon. And for those customers, there are also a lot of concessions. And I have to say, compared with the rental spec Jeeps that I've driven over in the States and the entry level one that I tested a few weeks ago, when you're sat in here, actually, it doesn't feel all that bad. Sure, the materials aren't of the highest quality, but there's plenty of leather, the dash has some nice stitching, there's some weird carbon effect sort of stuff going on over here, but overall the impact is actually of a car that they've put some effort into. It doesn't feel quite as upmarket as a modern day Land Rover, but it does feel a big step on from, say, the old Defender. It's not a bad place to spend your time. On long journeys and on the motorway, the biggest issue really is the noise made by these very off-road biased tyres, but when you're around the lanes doing 40, 50, it's not really much of an issue. And I have to say, I do have a lot of respect for the Jeep's heart on the sleeve approach to the way that it does things. So there's a lot about this car that feels very, very much old school. From the bonnet, where at the front I thought it had a sensor for automatic cruise control that actually turned out to be just the uh, key to unlock it. It does have auto cruise control as well. The car doesn't have automatic wipers, which may well be a conscious decision. The cigarette lighter down here is still marked as a cigarette lighter and not a 12 volt socket. You've also got the already mentioned off-road controls and then next to it you've got a series of four different auxiliary switches to presumably enable or disable stuff that you can then wire into the car. Much like the Defender, the cabin itself is also actually quite narrow. The doors themselves also feel a little bit flimsy, though at least they do have just about enough room for you to rest an arm on them, which famously the Land Rover did not. It does also feel surprisingly cramped in here for a vehicle that isn't all that small. And one major complaint I do have about the Jeep, it is not a particularly easy car to place. Land Rover are very proud of what they call their command driving position, which means that when you're sat in a dirty, great big full-size Range Rover, you can still place it fairly easily. You hop in this and you think it's the same, but it's not. When this got delivered to me, the driver pulled it onto my drive and um, scraped down the side of one of my hedges. And I thought, what a silly, silly man he is. How has he achieved that? I then got in the car and nearly did exactly the same thing. And the reason for it is because when you're sat here, you can see all of that lovely bonnet. But you forget the bonnet isn't the corner of the car. There's this huge plastic piece all around the front, which is the edge of the car. And even me with my nice long torso sat here, I can't see it. You have to do that and then you can place the thing. I think if I owned one of these, I'd be tempted to buy sort of faux dictator flags so you knew where the corners of it were. It's quite frustrating that, and it is quite a wide thing this, about 1.9 meters. And when you know you can't see the corners of it, that does make it a touch disconcerting. It also isn't particularly big in here for the size of car. The boots, not massive. The interior space is okay. You will get four adults in here, but it is just a little tighter than you might expect. And with the roof on, it's also quite dark too. And that might be why on one of the light switches down here, if you twist it all the way around, you can turn the lights on which is nice. For 2024, Jeep updated all of the infotainment system, and I have to say it is a massive improvement over the old one. You've now got a much larger, cleaner, higher res display, which has wireless Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. It works really well. The Alpine stereo in here, it's, it's fine, it does the job. For some reason sounds a lot better when you're playing country music rather than anything else. The dials and dash here, all nice, clean, easy to read. The controls are pretty simple. No touch sensitive, capacitive nonsense in here. And it's just a, a good, honest car. 
there is a proper old-fashioned handbrake. That's nice. It's little sections like this where I do actually get somewhat concerned with the car because, like I say, you just don't know quite how big it is. Rear is fine because you can see in the wing mirrors, but where you've been is not an issue, it's where you're going. See, here we have a local zipping down the road, no interest in slowing down whatsoever, and I've got no idea if I'm about to hit them or not. None. For an off-roader, this seems like quite the oversight. Knowing where your wheels are is very, very important. And I'd like to know, for those who do have one of these and do take it off-road, is this a problem? Do you just get used to it? I mean, I guess you have people spotting you all the time, but surely you, you've got to have a way of dealing with that. And I would actually like to know, if you are one of these off-roady types, and either you've got one or maybe someone you know does, how well do they fare? Are they pretty good? I know people do modify these things, that's part of the enjoyment of it, isn't it? But uh, do they really do the job? I'd love to know. Naturally, if you do want to try and throw it down a road, you will very soon encounter a few issues, like the fact that it does weigh two tonnes, is quite high, and uh, these tyres are not meant for road performance. But that's fine, it's all part of this car's charm. And it is a charming car, this. One of the best bits about it, the roof, which does have the most awful name. Now, it's a brilliant idea, this. So at the front, you've got two, essentially, Targa panels. They look like polystyrene, but they're fiberglass, and they come out pretty easily. They can be stored in a little bag in the back, which, once you've done it, is actually fairly simple. The whole rear section can then also be removed, which is not quite so easy. And unfortunately, here in Britain, I don't think you're very likely to do that all that often because there aren't going to be many days where you trust the weather enough to not rain at some point. It also is, with all of the roof off, quite chilly. In fact, it's chilly enough in this weather, even with just these two panels out, which is why I've got them on. And you can even, if you're feeling particularly brave, remove the doors. But yeah, this roof, it's called the Freedom Top. <laughs> Just, why? Why? I mean, what do they call this gearbox? The Screaming Eagle 8 Speed? What's the colour scheme of this? The stitching? Rivers of Communist Blood Red? I just... <sighs> really? Freedom Top? What's the turning circle like? I'm not expecting it to be great. And it's not. Yeah, surprise, surprise. That's fine. Steering rack is also quite slow, which of course you would expect in a 4x4. And you do have to be somewhat wary because I've got it currently in two-wheel drive mode. The ground, as you might be able to see, is quite damp. And uh, it does like to slide about on occasion. But that all just makes it really quite entertaining. In fact, the whole car, it's just, it's just lovable. From the moment you get into it, and getting into these is just the best thing ever. It makes you feel amazing, because it first looks really, really weird and awkward, because the car's kind of quite high, but the roof line's actually quite low. The aperture you have to get in is not quite as generous as you think it maybe should be. But then you realize you're just doing it wrong. What you do is you put your foot on the side step, you grab this, and you get in. And it's brilliant. I, I just love it. And I have really, really enjoyed driving this. I've done a better motorway, I've done a better town, I've done a better country, I took it into London. It's been a decent companion. But there are a few issues with it. First off, there are small little things that do begin to annoy you, like the fact that closing the door seems just more work than it really should be. The number of times you think you've shut it and actually you haven't, that's a frustration. The seatbelt sensors are way, way too sensitive. I went out the other day with some friends and I was in the back and you just lean on the armrest in the middle and it sets the seatbelt sensor off. So I had to plug it in to stop it going beep at us all the damn time. It is also, as mentioned, a constantly daunting car to drive. You're always slightly concerned that there is more of it than you can see and you're just never quite sure if maybe you're taking up a bit more room than you think. 
the number of times I've had someone come past and I've worried that actually we're about to sort of touch wing mirrors and it hasn't happened, but I've always felt like it's never been that far away. This engine, it is functional but it's not exciting. The gearbox is giving it a lot of help by having plenty of ratios and stacking them fairly close together. It's entertaining to see a car where the speedo finishes at 120. I'm used to them stopping at 220. Means that when you're on the motorway doing 70, it's all the way around there. That's not really a criticism, that's an observation. Oh, I just caught my camera, didn't I, on a twig. See, this is the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Here in Britain, we also don't have anywhere near the amount of options that they do in the USA. Not just in terms of engine, but also body configuration. So over there, they have a two-door, which I think is actually the cooler of the pair. This sure is going to be the more useful, but the two doors are awesome. You also can get that with a soft top. Here, you're going to have a hard top, whether you like it or not. And here, they offer just the two trim levels, Sahara and Rubicon, which is this. And they're a little bit confusing because used to road cars as I am, they look like they're the wrong way around because Rubicon is the more expensive, only by about £2,000. But that's the one that gets you smaller wheels and it's also got a non color coded top. The Sahara has this matching body color and it has larger wheels. The reason for this is the Rubicon is the more off-road orientated one and for this crowd that means it is worth more. It's also got a different suspension set up, though of course you can do an awful lot more to them, lift them and do everything you could basically imagine. You also have the nice Rubicon detailing inside, you've got these lovely leather seats and various other things, but by and large both trim levels are pretty similar. They're also quite expensive. In the USA, the Jeep starts at something like $33,000, which is less than £30,000. This is 65 grand. And that's a lot. But in its defense, if you were to actually spec a US Jeep up to the same level as this, the price differential is nowhere near as great as you might think. There's an awful lot that is standard here that is optional there, so it's not quite so terrible value for money. These days, of course, everything is also expensive and 65 grand is no longer the amount of money that it once was. The modern day Defender, while I'm sure a much, much nicer vehicle inside and much better on the road and all that, is even more money again. And there's something just a little bit different about a Jeep. I suppose if we were in the USA, the roles would be reversed and having a Defender would be the unusual and weird choice. But here it's not. That would be the Jeep. And people like it. Other than the man in the Mitsubishi who was rightly concerned that I was about to crash into him earlier because, well, I'm taking up nearly all of the road. And there are some other issues with the Jeep too. Earlier I decided to check what the fuel economy was, and this car has been averaging in the week that I've had it 19.4 to the gallon. That's bad. Really bad. Now there's a chance that that may be a US MPG figure, so I took the liberty of converting it. And if that is the case, then the car is actually achieving 23 to the gallon, which is still bad. It's not quite as bad, but it's still bad. That's sort of E46 or E92 BMW M3 fuel economy. And it's not BMW M3 performance, I can tell you. I suppose maybe people would be kind of used to that, and at least in its defence, it does have an enormous fuel tank, so you've still got reasonable range. 80 litres in here. And I can't help but think that you're kind of never going to get the best of this in Britain, because in the States there are plenty of places I know where you would just take that whole roof off for half the year, because you have the weather for it, and nearly everybody in certain places has a garage so they can store not only the car, but the roof as well. It's not an issue. Here though, space is at much more of a premium. The weather isn't anywhere near as good, and so 
You're just driving around in a car, not really using it to its full potential. And that's a shame. But for somebody that loves the idea of a proper old school off-roader, and for whatever reason, and there are many, many excellent reasons, doesn't want an old Defender, and maybe either can't afford or also just doesn't want the new Defender, this to me seems like it could strike a really quite nice balance. And I have to say, I thought after my week with this, I would be very happy to wave it goodbye and then return to driving all of my own cars. But actually, I'm gonna kinda miss this. And that's frustrating, because I thought this was gonna cure me of my desire for a Wrangler. It hasn't. I'll have mine in that hot pink that they do. Thank you very much. And so, there we go. That's the end of the video. I'm sure I've missed out loads. If I have, hop down in the comment section and we'll have a chat about it. But thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to hit the like button. Comment down below. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.